on World News Tonight. Renewed shelling. Strikes at Ukraine nuclear plant leads UN chief to call for demilitarized zone. FBI search. Merrick Garland breaks his silence saying he approved Trump's search warrant. Climate crisis. Arctic melts and extreme drought hits many parts of Europe with France being turned into ash. And celebrating culture. Dressed in traditional garments, people rejoice World's Indigenous People's Day. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin in China. A white paper detailing intentions to claim Taiwan has been released and this updated version has omitted a line that had been included in previous papers with regard to the potential presence of China's troops in the island nation. For the first time since Chinese President Xi Jinping came to power more than nine years ago, China on Wednesday released its white paper on Taiwan were refused to rule out force in order to unify the island with the mainland. It also blamed Taipei's independence-seeking ruling party for deepening dispute with Beijing. The document, which stressed that China will tolerate no foreign interference in Taiwan, comes just days after Beijing held unprecedented military drills around the island in the wake of a visit by U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to the island. In a preamble to the document, it noted that the bid to unify Taiwan and the mainland is a shared aspiration of all Chinese people. Later in the white paper, it stressed that Taiwan has belonged to China since ancient times and that it's indisputable fact. It cited archaeological discoveries and research findings that attest to the development of Taiwan by the Chinese people in earlier periods. While the document later says that China is promoting a peaceful resolution and a peaceful development of cross-straits relations, it did not rule out the use of force to accomplish its bid. The statement raises major concerns for Taiwan and its allies, with fears that a military conflict could be on the horizon. China released two white papers on Taiwan before this recent document. The first was titled The Taiwan Question and Reunification of China and published in August 1993 followed by the One China Principle and the Taiwan Issue in February 2000. These two white papers provided a comprehensive and systematic look at the basic principles and policies regarding the resolution on the Taiwan Issue. Amid record inflation, legislative stalemates in Congress and low presidential approval, many political watchers have predicted a wipeout for Democrats in November's midterm elections. But some say the tide may turn following the several recent legislative victories. It's been a good few weeks for Democrats. And with the midterm elections just three months away, U.S. President Joe Biden wants to talk about it. Biden is planning to travel across the country to tout a series of recent legislative victories on climate change, gun control, and drug pricing. The president, whose public approval ratings ticked up this week but still remain historically low at just under 40 percent, plans to use those victories to rally support for Democrats ahead of the November 8 midterm elections as Republicans hope to retake control of Congress. Usually the party in power tends to have bad summers in midterm years. Democrats have had a good summer. John Reinish, a Democratic strategist based in New York, said the spate of good news couldn't have come at a better time for Biden's party. Democratic voters who voted for lowering prescription drug prices, um, uh, taking on climate change, uh, boosting manufacturing. Um, you know, for a long time, Democrats on the Hill in the White House were perceived as not getting anything done, couldn't get out of their own way. And many, frankly, thought asleep at the wheel. Well, that's really, really changed around. You're seeing some wind at their backs. You're seeing Democrats delivering popular kitchen table stuff for the American people. Uh, and, and I think voters are a lot happier. I will also say um, Democrats have been a lot more aggressive. And voters of all stripes like it when they see lawmakers, their party, their candidates fighting for them. And Democrats are seeing that. The U.S. Senate this week approved a Biden-backed measure known as the Inflation Reduction Act to fight climate change, lower drug prices, and raise some corporate taxes. That comes on the heels of the passage of a slew of bipartisan bills, one tackling gun violence, another funding domestic semiconductor production, another funding health care for veterans. Not to mention, gas prices are now dropping to their lowest level in months. 
And there is yet another issue that could help Democrats. Reinisch says abortion could bring voters to the polls, as many red states have enacted draconian anti-abortion laws in the wake of the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. What you have seen Republicans pushing is the government overreach that voters of all stripes hate, from a moderate voter even to the most conservative voter. And uh, Republicans have tethered themselves to extreme and unpopular policies that I think flips a lot of assumptions, a lot of narratives uh, 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 for the midterm elections. Still, it's an uphill climb for Democrats. Republicans are favored to win control of the House. Democrats could also lose their edge in the Senate, though some analysts are now saying control of the chamber is up for grabs. In a rare move, the U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland is speaking out, saying he personally approved the FBI search of former U.S. President Trump's home at Mar-a-Lago, while he said he could not provide further details of the basis of the search. This comes after the former president attacked the search as an act of political retribution. In an extraordinary appearance, the Attorney General made a careful exception to the usual secrecy of investigations under pressure to explain the Monday search of former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago home and office. First, I personally approve the decision to seek a search warrant in this matter. Second, the department does not take such a decision lightly. Merrick Garland moved to make more about the unprecedented search public. The Justice Department filed this motion asking a federal court in Florida to unseal the Trump warrant, which would include the inventory of items seized by the FBI. The public's clear and powerful interest in understanding what occurred under these circumstances weighs heavily in favor of unsealing. Garland argues that Mr. Trump, in effect, waived the confidentiality that is typically provided. The former president publicly confirmed the search that evening as is his right. Late today, the court ordered the Justice Department to meet with Donald Trump's lawyers to determine if they oppose unsealing the warrant, giving them until Friday afternoon to respond. Today, the attorney general suggested that a court-approved FBI search might have been avoidable, but without explaining why. Where possible, it is standard practice to seek less intrusive means as an alternative to a search. According to sources, a June 3rd subpoena was delivered to the office of the former president, requiring classified and government documents be turned over. Then a meeting was set up to retrieve them. Mr. Trump stopped by. At that time, officials asked to see the storage room, and the former president agreed. Days later, authorities sent an email to request better security, and a second lock was added. Weeks passed until the August 8th search. Today, the former president posted a comment. My attorneys and representatives were cooperating fully. The government could have had whatever they wanted. His daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, says she wanted more answers from Garland. A lot of Americans uh, were looking for something, anything that they could look to from the attorney general that would reassure them that this was not a political attack. Garland clearly had another, more personal reason to come forward. I will not stand by silently when their integrity is unfairly attacked. Denouncing what he called unfounded attacks against law enforcement and prosecutors, some of that fueled by Trump supporters this week. They protect the American people from violent crime, terrorism, and other threats to their safety while safeguarding our civil rights. Russia and Ukraine accused each other of shelling Europe's biggest nuclear power plant in southern Ukraine as the UN chief proposed a demilitarized zone at the site amid fears of a catastrophe. Shelling near Europe's biggest nuclear power plant in southern Ukraine has stirred alarm among local officials, the United Nations and the International Atomic Energy Agency. Ukraine has in recent days warned of the risk of a Chernobyl-style nuclear disaster. And on Thursday, Ukraine's interior minister said they had to be ready for any scenario at the Russian-controlled Zaporizhia plant. There are plans that consider every possible development of the situation, including emission of radiation. That's why our plans include the evacuation from nearby settlements. I want to remind that this is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. It has six energy blocks. Of course, it's difficult to even imagine the scale of the tragedy, 
which could come into effect if Russians continue their actions there. Russia seized the plant in March. It's still run by its Ukrainian technicians, but officials say those workers are not allowed into certain areas to do their job properly. And on Thursday, Moscow and Kyiv blamed each other for a renewed shelling. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky on Thursday strongly condemned what he called Russia's nuclear terrorism. Russia has become a terrorist country and is holding nuclear power stations hostage, blackmailing everyone with a potential disaster. UN chief Antonio Gutierrez urgently called for a demilitarized zone around the plant, a call echoed by IAEA chief Rafael Grossi, who briefed the 15-member UN Security Council on Thursday at the request of Russia. These military actions, dear colleagues, near such a large nuclear facility could lead to very serious consequences. Russia's UN ambassador urged IAEA representatives to visit the plant as soon as possible, saying the world was being pushed to the brink of nuclear catastrophe, comparable in scale with Chernobyl. The Arctic has warmed nearly four times faster than the rest of the planet over the last 40 years, according to research published that suggests climate models are underestimating the rate of polar heating. Massive, crumbling blocks of ice. Signs of an alarming trend in the North Pole. During the last 43 years, the Arctic has been warming nearly four times faster than the globe. Our results indicate that the recent four-fold Arctic warming ratio is either an extremely unlikely event or the climate models systematically tend to underestimate the amplification. The study was conducted by analyzing temperature data gathered since 1979 over the entire Arctic Circle. The findings showed that the Svalbard archipelagos off the coast of Norway have even warmed a staggering seven times faster than the rest of the world. The Arctic is heating up faster than any corner of the planet due to multiple factors, such as changes in the amount of air pollution coming from Europe and natural multi-decade climate variations. But the main underlying culprit being human-caused global warming. Experts warn of detrimental repercussions across local communities and wildlife. Separate studies show the vast body of ice sheet covering Greenland may be approaching a melting tipping point. That sheet contains enough frozen water to raise global sea levels by some six meters. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, thousands of people have evacuated as wildfires continue to rage on across Europe, with ongoing heat waves and drought now threatening multiple countries in that region, with France, Germany and Portugal seeing the most devastation of the historic fires this summer. A scorched car and not even four walls are all that remains of this house in boulain bellier Firefighters worked all night to stop a massive fire in the Gironde region in southwestern France. Some were unlucky, but others were thankful to find their homes untouched by the flames. The wind changed and pushed the fire here, so we saw flames just outside our house. But we can say a big thank you to the firefighters. The fire, now focused around the towns of Londeras and Ostens, originally sparked in July, but continued to smolder after it was contained and flared again two days ago. The fire destroyed 600 hectares last night. As of this morning, that's a total of 6,800 hectares. Visiting the area along with the Interior Minister on Thursday, French Prime Minister Elisabeth Bonn promised more equipment to fight the flames. We have never mobilized so many resources and we will continue to reinforce them. When the president came here in July, we had two water bombing helicopters. We have nine today and we'll have 11 by the end of the week. Countries across Europe have sent reinforcements to help extinguish the blaze. That includes two tanker planes from Greece, two Swedish water bombers, as well as firefighters from Poland, Germany, Austria and Romania. So far this year, France has seen more than 57,000 hectares destroyed by wildfires.
Relief efforts in response to the damage caused by the recent rain continues in South Korea, but quite a number of roads and parks along the Hung River in capital Seoul remain closed. Authorities say the death toll from the downpour stands at 13, while six people remain missing. South Korea is grappling with the damage caused by the record downpours that flooded homes and roads in the country's central region earlier this week. According to the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters, 13 people died as a result of extreme weather conditions, while the search continues for six that are still missing. At least 18 people were reported to have been injured. The heavy rain forced nearly 5,000 people, mostly in the greater Seoul area, to evacuate their homes. Some nine square kilometers of farmland were also submerged. That's an area bigger than 1,600 football fields. Meanwhile, on Wednesday, Seoul City announced plans to spend 1.5 trillion won, or 1.15 billion U.S. dollars, over the next decade to build six large-scale underground rainwater storage and drainage facilities, also called deep underground tunnels, to better handle such natural disasters. Those plans won't come soon enough, however, as more heavy rain is expected next week, which is likely to cause further damage across the country. A strong rain front is expected to hit the Seoul metropolitan area starting Monday night and Chungcheongdo provinces by Tuesday morning. While the duration of the downpours may not be long, even more rain is expected than in the torrents already seen due to lingering atmospheric conditions. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Han dok su on Friday instructed the government to swiftly take steps to designate special disaster zones for areas hit by the heavy rain earlier this week. Such designations will make them eligible for government financial support, which includes recovery work as well as relief funds for victims. While the Liberation Day long weekend is expected to have clearer weather, people are advised to prepare for heavier downpours next week to minimize further damages. South Korea's President Yoon suk yeol has granted his first round of presidential pardons ahead of the National Liberation Day. Samsung Electronics Vice Chairman J.Y. Lee was pardoned with South Korea's Justice Ministry, saying that the business leader was needed to help overcome a national economic crisis. Samsung Electronics Vice Chairman and former leader J.Y. Lee, who was once jailed for bribery, was pardoned by South Korea's President Yoon suk yeol on Friday. The act, however, was largely symbolic. Lee is already out on parole, released last year after serving 18 months in jail. But South Korea's justice minister said the move was weighed against more pressing issues. With an urgent need to overcome the national economic crisis, we carefully selected economy leaders who lead the national growth engine through active technology investment and job creation to be pardoned. By giving them a chance to take part in the economic development once again, we would like to maximize our efforts to overcome the economic crisis. South Korea is grappling with inflation, and there are signs it's struggling with weak demand and a spending slowdown. It's also heavily dependent on tech and exports, and Samsung is by far the biggest of the country's conglomerates, as well as the biggest maker of smartphones and memory chips in the world. Analysts believe the presidential pardon could grant Lee more freedom to conduct business and may mean big M&A moves are around the corner. Others warn that legal risks still persist as Lee still faces charges of fraud and stock manipulation in another ongoing trial. Lee, who is a descendant of Samsung's founding family, welcomed the decision and vowed to work hard for the national economy. Lee had already returned to the limelight long before his pardon. Last November, Samsung decided on Taylor, Texas as the site of a new $17 billion chip plant, while in May, Lee appeared alongside President Yoon and U.S. President Joe Biden on a visit to Samsung's chip production facilities. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Argentinian scientists presented the first armored two-legged South American dinosaur, a species that lived in Patagonia around 100 million years ago. McDonald's said that it plans to reopen its restaurants in Ukraine over the next few months in an early sign of Western businesses returning to the country even as the conflict with Russia returns. President Yoon suk yeol hosted a luncheon with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres in Seoul. Among the issues addressed were regional security challenges including North Korea's nuclear ambitions as well as global 
concerns such as climate change. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we air tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you tonight with indigenous people from all over Mexico gathering in Mexico City's Zocalo to mark International Indigenous People's Day. Stay safe, have a great weekend and a good night.